You know, it's funny. A Nintendo Direct happened recently, and honestly, it was pretty good. Pikmin 4 is actually a thing literally 10 years since the last main installment. Tears of the Kingdom is looking real good. Metroid Prime getting a remaster and dropping the same day? I know I've been pretty cynical in the past when I've talked about Nintendo. It's not personal, but I find myself gravitating towards other franchises nowadays. To give you an idea, Fire Emblem Engage has been out for a bit now, and I still haven't played it. I really want to, but Like a Dragon Ishin is out now. So yeah, your boy's gotta prioritize. That's all besides the point though. I shouldn't have had my expectations set high anyways. But after spending so much time looking back at Star Fox recently, I sat there watching and was like, Come on, Star Fox. Come on, Star Fox. But the direct went on and eventually ended, with no mammals in sight. I wasn't surprised, but I mean with the Prime Remaster, I really thought there was a chance. Just a small chance that Nintendo would finally give us something. I mean, hell, even a remake of Assault. It was not to pass. I was happy with what we did get, but as they say, the heart wants what the heart wants. Recently, I found myself playing a lot of Smash for something else I have in the works. Since Fox is my main in Melee, I've just been feeling kind of nostalgic for the Space Animal Gang. Star Fox means so much to me, and I'm glad to have seen that it matters to a lot of you as well. We've been kind of in limbo for almost seven years. Honestly, it's at a point where I wouldn't be surprised if we never see a Star Fox game again. I would argue there's no better time than now to bring Fox and Co. back. But people have been saying that about F-Zero for years, and that hasn't seen an entry since 2004. Like I mentioned in my last Star Fox video, I think it's time for Miyamoto and his team to step aside. They have their priorities elsewhere, and that's fine, even now. I still think someone who's hungry and eager to create should be given a stab with Star Fox. Nintendo has already loaned this IP out to four separate studios. This wouldn't be anything new. And just because I love these games, for better or for worse, let me help you out, Nintendo. I may have found just the team for you. Oh, hell yeah! Ladies and gentlemen, bunnies and frogs everywhere, allow me to introduce you to First Squadron, an indie developed on rail shooter from Spanish developers Raptor Claw Games. Before we get any further, I need to disclaim that I was fortunate enough to receive a code for the Steam port, which at the time of this video's release isn't out yet. You can play the game right now on iOS and Android, but the Steam, as well as Nintendo Switch ports, will be released March 17th. I want to thank Raptor Claw Games for sending the code over. However, I must preface that the views in this video are mine and mine alone. And with that out of the way, let's get right into it. This is what happens when someone is ambitious enough to take something that inspired them and create something of their own. This is what happens when you're dedicated and quite frankly crazy enough to see your vision through to the end, even if you have to make a few compromises. This is what happens when you try to unify a fan base starved of games in one of their favorite franchises. This is First Squadron. Well, doesn't this look familiar? If you couldn't already tell, First Squadron is essentially what I'd define as a quote-unquote clone of your traditional Star Fox game. You're on rails, you shoot down enemies to obtain a high score, the levels typically end with a boss fight, yeah, everything's here, it's your typical Star Fox game. I decided to go through the entire game so I could draw my own conclusions on the game as a whole before reaching out with a few questions for clarification. I should say, what you see here is what you're going to get throughout the entire experience. Don't expect any all range sections or anything like that. First Squadron, relatively speaking, is pretty small. The game consists of five different stages with three different difficulties to play them on. That seems pretty small, right? Honestly though, it definitely doesn't feel like five stages. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I think these are five expertly crafted stages, even when compared to the source material, which is really saying something. By the nature of these types of games, I think it's even more impressive to achieve something this good with the resources the devs had. Since this is essentially a Star Fox game, I decided I'd treat it as such for what I wish to discuss with you today. Regardless of where it's at now, Star Fox will always be regarded as a somewhat successful Nintendo franchise. 
so much so that it warrants a guaranteed place in Smash in every release. With Nintendo seemingly not interested in giving us a new game, is there a chance that a game like First Squadron can take over as the Star Fox game we've been looking for? A contender for the king. You can tell I really like this narrative. My answer? Yeah, I think it can. Seriously, I'm a big fan of what's here and what for could potentially come. To make things simpler, I'm going to take a look at what First Squadron is directly taking inspiration from, compare them where it's appropriate, and give my reasoning for my verdict. It might not be the best way to go when looking at a game in and of itself, but I think for what we're trying to accomplish today, it's the most fitting way to go about it. Setting the stage a bit, the First Squadron consists of three members. Leader Blaze Mustella, I want to say he's a raccoon or a badger, maybe a mix of both? Hothead pilot Kiro Nax, and the adorable Axlotl Axel Mex, your tech expert. I mean, these images don't do the best job showcasing it, but these character designs are stunning. I mean, wow, I see the inspiration very clearly, but they are still wholly original. Blaze is obviously inspired by Fox sporting a similar jacket and typically seen with a slight smirk on his face to convey his confidence. Kiro is inspired by Wolf, adding a unique dynamic where the rival character is on the team rather than leading their own mercenary gang. His design is just wow. The orange fur conveying a mohawk, the eye patch, the leather jacket, it's all just so awesome. And I mean, even someone as cold as me can see how cute Axel is. Rocking the same outfit as Blaze, Axel stands out with her cute face expressions, conveying that she's confident in her abilities, but still worries about her teammates. They're a fantastic group to have together. While playing the game, you'll notice how well they bounce off each other. Blaze is definitely confident, but still a bit of a goody-goody, so he doesn't mind taking a refresher course. Kiro is brash, ambitious, and hot-headed, but has just a childlike, pure desire to take to the skies. Axel wants to prepare her teammates as much as possible and to show how much of an asset she can be with her knowledge of technology. I'll get more into the story later, but I just wanted to paint a little picture before you start the adventure. As I've mentioned in the past, I think that a lot of the appeal of Star Fox was down to the iconic characters themselves. The space animal thing just works, and when you see what happens to the team as the story unfolds in each game, you'll see why they were so beloved. When I look at the first squadron, I see the same potential. The character designs are great and distinct enough to separate it from the source material, but clear enough to show the inspiration, and the characters themselves replicate who they're trying to portray with their own unique twist. I love the voice acting they decided to go with, mimicking the acting in the original SNES Star Fox. <laughs> Barrel will with pack asset. I just really, really like them, alright? Sue me. Due to what I assume was budgetary reasons, the team decided it would initially release First Squadron on mobile platforms. I checked it out on iPad after beating it on PC, and I was very impressed. It's a very competent way to play the game. I guess I can't really speak on the performance because mobile phones are even more volatile in terms of differences than PC is. When I asked the dev team about it, they clarified that the upcoming PC and Switch ports are one-for-one -one ports of the mobile version. Obviously, these platforms will have more options in the settings, but in terms of the actual game, the build should be the same. And dude, this runs buttery smooth on PC. I got a smooth 144 frames per second and at 1440p resolution. And man, that tied together with this vaporwave aesthetic, it's just pure eye candy. Honestly, in concept, going with the vaporwave design is pretty risky. I think it can be hit or miss depending on how it's executed. No need to worry here. Raptor Claw nailed it. Out of the park, on the money, any other cliche you can think of. The Vaporwave aesthetic is meant to act as a VR training simulator for our pilots. And from what I can tell, these VR headsets are connected directly to the operator's brain. With that context in mind, I think the presentation as a whole is pretty fantastic. When you boot up the game, you're greeted with this menu that just continues to pan forward into a void of nothingness while you hear this ominous melody. When you're flying, the enemies clearly pop out in three distinct colors, giving you a clear visual cue on where to target. The architecture in the levels is very reminiscent of the source material, but given that bright, somewhat odd twist that can only come from this vaporwave look. The ship designs, even though they're kinda basic, functioning more like holograms are all really cool. I can definitely see some Arwing inspiration, maybe even the Cloud Runner from Command, but they're all unique and distinct from each other. The UI is sleek and smooth to navigate. When choosing a stage, each level will have a small blur 
of explaining what you should expect. Just top to bottom, this game looks great. Yeah, it's a small game, but when it looks this good, who cares? Now let's get to what you're actually going to be doing in First Squadron. I mean, the characters are great, but you're not exactly here just for them. There's a game to be played, and having gone through all of it, I can confidently say this is really something special. At its core, in its essence, whatever you want to say. First Squadron is essentially just Star Fox. It's much prettier than most Star Fox games in my opinion, but a Star Fox game nonetheless. Your goal is simple, just make it through the level with your ship intact, defeat the enemies that come your way, and kill the boss in the end to finish the level. To keep things interesting, I thought it'd be fun to take a look at the game that First Squadron takes direct inspiration from. When I initially played it, I figured First Squadron was taking inspiration from the original Star Fox on the SNES. The vaporwave aesthetic and overall general feel of the game gives me heavy Star Fox SNES vibes, and the fact that the characters all talk like this felt like it was just giving it away. But there's a Reddit post, which I'll link in a pinned comment or in the bio, where lead developer and founder of Raptor Claw Games, Pedro Silva, says that First Squadron was inspired by Star Fox 64. When I thought about this more, it made way more sense. Where the SNES version of Star Fox showcases the product of stretching a console to its technical limit, Star Fox 64 took that concept and actually made an engaging, exciting on-rail shooter, one I would argue still stands as the best in the genre. Star Fox 64 prioritized the gameplay above all else. It's fast, smooth, satisfying, difficult, and most importantly, fun. It didn't do too much in the story department, but it was enough to make the adventure feel more grand. The voice acting was added just to have a bit more personality. It's a game that thrives on getting the player addicted to its admittedly simple yet deep system to get you experimenting with new routes so you can experience all the game has to offer. First Squadron embodies most of what made Star Fox 64 special in the first place, making a few compromises in some areas to enhance what really matters in my opinion. Directly comparing a full-fledged, arguably AAA experience to a small indie port of a mobile game would be a bit unfair. I mean, looking at it from a resource perspective, it's not even a competition. So to keep things fair, I'm going to be looking at First Squadron from the perspective of looking at what it adapted from Star Fox 64. No better place to start in my opinion than the gameplay. To your average person, put these two side by side and besides the art style, you won't see that much of a difference. But if you've been in the trenches of Star Fox for as long as I have, you can instantly tell a few differences. Star Fox 64 is blessed with this brilliant nuance. So even if the controls and premise are simple, you have this beautiful game feel that allows you to freely move in any way with the space allotted to you. A really skilled player can abuse the system to end up pulling stuff like this to get through as quickly as possible. First Squadron takes this idea and runs with it. And I mean it dials it up to 11 at times. Wow. When I played the game's normal difficulty titled Blaze, that's adorable by the way, I found the controls to be a bit stiffer than I would have liked. I didn't change any of the control settings so I could see the dev team's vision for the game in its entirety, so to speak. I did get used to the stiffness I felt and was able to blow by the Blaze difficulty with no real trouble. At this point, I was thinking to myself, damn, this game is pretty solid. I was genuinely impressed. I mean, this is a mobile game. I never imagined I'd have this much fun with it. The Blaze difficulty is equivalent to your standard Star Fox 64 route. Just going from each level beginning to end, fighting the boss, pretty by the books. When you finish the game on Blaze mode, you unlock the Kiro level difficulty. The enemy patterns are the same from what I could tell, but they take more hits to take down and deal out more damage per hit. This is where things started heating up. I was able to get through pretty quickly, relatively speaking, but this is where I started struggling a bit. It's also where I finally got the brilliance of this formula, and I fell even harder for this genre. The satisfaction you get when you make it through a tough dogfight with just a sliver of health is unparalleled. There's just nothing like it. The Kiro difficulty really excels at opening up the game. I mean, there's no differences between the levels throughout the difficulties. It's the same five levels, just with some added challenge. One change I did make was upping the cursor sensitivity one level just so I could really move around this wide area you're given. It's also in the Kiro mode when I realized how much faster this game is compared to Star Fox 64. Upping the cursor sensitivity definitely helped me see that. I mean, we haven't even reached the peak yet and it's going this fast? Where it lacks in presentation, story, world building, First Squadron excels in the most important area of a video game in my opinion, the actual game. Yeah, we're missing the all range section from Star Fox 64. We only have five levels, but when playing the game, it just makes sense. I think Raptor Claw Games was hyper-focused on crafting the best, most complex form of your standard Star Fox 64 level. Does it reach that level? Let's get into it. I purposely saved this difficulty for last because this is where the game reaches what I would consider the peak. It's on the Axel difficulty where First Squadron tests your skills and tasks you with pushing past what you think is possible in order to succeed. 
Yeah, all this in a mobile game with five levels. It's insane. The enemies take even more hits. I'm pretty sure there's even more enemies in general. And you die in like two hits? No joke, like two or three hits and you're dead. This was probably the most frustrated I have ever gotten with a Star Fox game like this before and I loved it. Each stage felt like a puzzle in a way, so figuring out the best solution to success while taking the least amount of damage possible was thrilling. It made me look at this genre from a totally different perspective. Star Fox 64, even at its hardest difficulty, isn't anything too taxing. I mean, a majority of the boss fights are a joke. They usually need to add a unique gimmick to make them interesting like the Volcane fight on Solar. In First Squadron, the boss fights are meticulously designed to scale in difficulty. I'd say the biggest difference across all the difficulties is the timing between each move the boss fights does. On Axel difficulty where one of these mega hits can kill you, you really have to get a handle of the controls and use all the techniques to your advantage, while simultaneously figuring out the best way to land hits on the boss's weak point. Each of the bosses will have a weak point highlighted either sporadically or throughout the entire fight that you need to constantly shoot at. Even though these bosses in terms of size are massive, these weak spots vary in terms of size. Sometimes they'll be big enough for you to land shots while you're moving the cursor, while others are so small you have to be 100% accurate with all your shots. This is ripped pretty much like for like from Star Fox 64, although I do have to say, some of these were a little ridiculous. You see this guy's weak point? It's the size of a ladybug. And my perspective and controls get inverted? Seriously? Even if I wish the sizing of the weak points were a little more consistent, the satisfaction I got beating this game on Axel difficulty was thrilling. These boss fights are exactly what I mean when I say I had to think differently about the genre. Star Fox 64's boss fights are pretty formulaic. They all follow the same general pattern and it's pretty easy to avoid the enemy attacks. First Squadron says to hell with that. Let's go as fast as possible, constantly putting you in situations that'll kill you while you have to shoot at the weak points? It's insane! I was really overwhelmed at first and was getting bodied, but eventually I sat forward, took a deep breath, and went beast mode. Man, this game's so cool. I love Star Fox. I always have and I always will. But First Squadron takes everything I love from the source material and dials it up to 100 to craft a simple yet brilliant love letter to one of gaming's most iconic franchises. Before we wrap up, let's quickly go over the narrative. It's pretty brief, but it's definitely worth mentioning. Axel creates a VR training sim for Kiro and Blaze so they can practice aerial combat to prepare for the battle to come with the Scal Empire. Each level acts as a lesson Axel programmed into the simulation to prep the team for the battle ahead. As you progress through the training, Blaze notices some weird glitches in the system, but disregards it at first. But as you get deeper into the system, the world starts acting weirder and weirder until it's eventually revealed that General Grillis, sworn enemy of the first squadron, hacked into the program to fry the team's brains. It's pretty messed up, man. Why don't you relax a little? On Axel difficulty, Grillis presents arguably the hardest challenge in an Unreal shooter, if I'm being honest. He incorporates a few of the boss fights while also trying to gun you down himself. Eventually, though, you'll overcome all the challenges laid before you to bring Grillis down for good. Axel advises Blaze to destroy the core of the program so they can reset the program. Hypothetically, this should wake all of them up, but turning off the system so suddenly may cause the opposite. The finality of this moment really hit me hard. I had spent a total of two hours with these characters, but on my final run, it really hit me. Indie games are for the most part survival of the fittest. It's hard to grab the public's attention when literally every day they have new options. And it's fair to say First Squadron has a lot working against it. So to see the developers let that play out in the story just really adds weight to the entire journey. It feels like it's the end, but Blaze assures us we'll be reunited on the other side. First Squadron is just fantastic. I think I've shelled it enough. It pays homage to the source material while distinguishing itself by advancing the gameplay to its logical next step. Its art style is fantastic just pure eye candy from beginning to end. Oh, and I haven't even mentioned the music. Star Fox 64 has a beautiful soundtrack fitting the more mercenary vibe. First Squadron though, I mean, I love lo-fi hip-hop, and I can definitely feel that when I listen to this. At the same time, it still feels epic like a space shutter should feel like. It's the unique combination of sounds that evokes this sense of chill.
but the game is definitely not afraid to get exciting. On the kernel run, you're greeted with this epic score to tackle the final boss. And hell, the soundtrack sometimes had me banging my head they were so good. I just love everything about this game, man. Even if I have a few nitpicks, that's all they are, nitpicks. None of my complaints detract the game in any way, which makes it all the more impressive. So after all this, I ask again, can First Squadron be the Star Fox game we've been waiting for? I think so, and I hope after watching this video, you think so too, because First Squadron can be so much more than what it already is. If you beat the game on either Blaze or Kiro difficulty, after finishing the game you'll see the credits pan out without much else. But if you beat the game on Axel, you get some extra dialogue. In this extra scene you see that Axel has found the location of the group who sent General Grillis. The first squadron prepare their counterattack, and we are left with the title of the hypothetical sequel, First Squadron Payback. Now we get to the part of the video where I want to look at First Squadron as it is now, and what it could be in the future. Originally, Pedro had the vision of making an open war scenario similar to Star Fox 64. The reason it shifted to a VR aesthetic was because of budget. Raptor Claw Games is a relatively small studio, so I understand compromises had to be made. As Pedro says himself, if 9 out of every 10 hours spent on the project were dedicated to the graphics of the setting alone, it was clear that it was impossible to finish the game. I mean, just looking at the images of what could have been, I really can't imagine gameplay this fast paced in a world that detailed on the budget they were on. It would have been cool to see for sure, but honestly, I think the team made the right decision. Even if it is compromising your vision, you still get to release the game you want to release. The game leaves an open thread for a sequel, so I'd love to see it happen. Will it though? I don't know to be honest with you. The gaming landscape is really diverse nowadays. Think of an idea for a game and it already probably exists. I think there's a place for shooters like this, and if Nintendo doesn't want to give us what we want, I'm happy to see someone out there still cares. In terms of First Squadron itself, yeah, I think with a more fleshed out story, take us out of the VR setup, and improve the gameplay that's already so good, why not? And this is a personal preference, but if you can get some voice acting if a sequel was to happen, that'd be great. And if you need a voice for any of the characters, I'm available anytime. Hint, hint, wink, wink. Whether we get that sequel all depends on you. This game's priced at $4.99 on mobile platforms and will cost $6.99 on Switch and Steam. If we want First Squadron payback, it'll all depend on how First Squadron sells. If it does well enough, we might get to see Raptor Claw Games' full vision realized. The full war between the Chimera Federation and Scal Empire. I'd love to see it, so check it out now. March 17th if you want it on console. To end off, I want to say thank you to Pedro and everyone over at Raptor Claw Games. Thank you for crafting something that shows how much love you have for the franchise I hold so near and dear to my heart. Thank you for advancing this genre forward to new heights that I hope inspires some of the big boys to craft something new too. Thank you for paying homage to a genre that's surely lacking in respect at the moment. The Star Fox team may be off duty right now, but the first squadron has our backs. And you know what? That's pretty cool. Shooter Yamina Wasima, 